questions. The questions that I'm talking about will be handed to you right now, and everybody needs one, every man, woman, boy, and girl. Guys, if you would. You might want to go ahead and try to find something to write with, but please do not start. We'll all start together. We'll stay together on this survey. But you might want to try to find something to write with, a pencil or a pen. It's been a beautiful day today. Yeah, no rain. No rain, yeah. Sunshine, this is the sunshine state. Glad to be in the sunshine state. We need some right over here. You already have them? Okay. Again, just please do not uh, begin. We'll all uh, start together. But I think over in this uh, section, we need a few. Did we miss anybody? No. Anybody need one? Okay. Let's look to number one. Have you ever made a commitment to Jesus? Have you ever accepted Jesus as your Savior? Surrendered to Him as Lord? If you have, circle yes. If you have not, circle no. And if you say no, I've never made a commitment to Christ, the rest of these questions, questions, Two through six do not apply to you. But if you say, yes, I've made a commitment to Christ, tell me, how old were you when you made this commitment? Were you 12, 15, 19, 38? If you do not remember your age, guesstimate it. Put that in the blank. We have a few coming in. Does anybody have some extra cards? Okay, I think they're taken care of, Jim. Okay, question number two, did you make a confession at the time of your commitment? Do you remember saying anything, confessing anything? If you did, circle yes. If you did not, circle no. If you say yes, I, I did make a confession, tell me in your own words, what did you confess? Did you confess your faith in Christ? Did you confess your sins? In your own words, tell me, what did you say on that occasion? What did you confess? Then number three, have you been baptized? Have in your life been baptized? If you have, circle yes. If you have not, underline that. If you say no, I, I've never been baptized, the rest of these questions, questions four, five, and six do not apply to you. But if you say yes, I've been baptized, tell me, how, how were you baptized? How were you baptized? Was water sprinkled upon you? Was water poured on your body? Were you dunked, immersed in water? Put that in the blank. Question number four, how long after your commitment were you baptized? You say, Keith, I made a commitment to Christ. That's wonderful. How long was it until you were baptized? Were you baptized a week later, a month later, the same day, a year later? Put that on the card. Very important question is question number five. You say, Keith, I've been baptized. That's wonderful. Why? Why did you do it? Why were you baptized? In your own words, put that in the blank. And then number six, were you saved before or after? Maybe I should say at the time of, at the point of your baptism. If you believe that you were saved sometime before you were baptized, circle that if you believe that you were saved after your baptism or 
when you were baptized at the point of baptism to note that. Now here's what I want you to do, folks. I want you to take the card and I want you to kind of fold it in half, okay? Hide your answers. This is a very personal thing. It's between you and the Lord. And then would you open your Bibles, please, to Mark chapter 16. It's the second book of God's new Bible. Matthew, Mark, there's the book. And we're going to chapter 16, the last chapter in the book. It's the resurrection chapter. Jesus has died upon the cross. He's been buried. And in Mark chapter 16, we read about his resurrection. I told the audience last night that we should never, ever tell sinners what to do until we tell them what God has already done. And then after we tell the sinners what God has done, we can tell them what to do. Well, last night we talked about what God has done. If you were with us, we talked about the cross. Uh, they crucified him. Uh, God loved us. He, he sent his son Jesus. So, so Jesus died upon the cross. He was buried. He was raised. We talked about the old Jerusalem gospel last night. What God has done. And tonight, I want to tell you what man needs to do. Mark 16. Let's go to verse 15. Verse 15. Some of the last words that Jesus spoke before ascending back into heaven. Mark 16 and verse 15. We call it the great charge, the great commission. It's found in all four gospel accounts. It's found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I think most of us are familiar with Matthew and Mark. Luke's account of the great commission, Luke 24 and verse 47. Jesus said that repentance and remission of sins, forgiveness of sins should be preached in all nations starting in Jerusalem. And then in John's account of the great commission, the great charge, John 20 and verse 21, Jesus said, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Of course, Jesus was sent to seek and to save the lost, Luke 19 and verse 10, and that's why we're sent out to seek and to save the lost. But listen to the Great Commission in Mark 16 and verse 15. Jesus said, I want you to go. Hey, disciples, go. Church, go. Brother, sister, go. He said, I want you to go into all the world. Go to El Salvador and go next door. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to everybody, to every person. And then he said, anybody, whosoever, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be condemned or shall be damned. Audience, there are three words, three words, and really only three words that I want us to focus in on for a few minutes in tonight's study. And the first one of these words is this one. It's the word believes. Jesus said, anybody that believes, question, believes what? If you believe, you believe in something. You say, Keith, I believe today was a marvelous day. Well, you believe in something. I, I, I believe that uh, I don't feel well tonight. You believe in something. I, I believe tomorrow is going to be a great day. You believe in something. Jesus said, he that believes, believes what? Well, you say we've got to believe in God, and I would say amen to that. Would you agree we've got to believe in God? Without faith it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11 and verse 6, amen. We've got to believe in God. We've got to believe that God exists. We've got to believe that God lives, that God is creator. You say, well, we've got to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And I would say, you're right. We, we've got to believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be. In fact, Jesus said in John 8 and verse 24, Except you believe that I am, I'm the Messiah, I am God. Except you believe that I am, you're going to die in your sins. So yes, we've got to believe in God, and we've got to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. But if you'll go back to verse 15, I think you'll find the answer to the question, believe what? Look back to verse 15. Jesus said, I want you to go into all the world. Go to your neighbors and friends. Go to America. Go to the Philippines, go to India, go to Jamaica, go to the Bahamas, go into all the world and preach, what audience? The gospel, the gospel. Now that's what I tried to preach last night, the gospel. The word gospel simply means good news. When Paul said in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, you know what he's saying? I'm not ashamed, I'm not embarrassed about the good news. And when Jesus said in Mark 16, 15, I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel, he's simply saying go into all the world and preach the good news. Now sometimes we preachers preach it as though it's bad news. Now Bob would never do this, okay? Uh, your preacher would never do this. But sometimes we preachers get up and, and, and maybe we come down hard and, and maybe we even beat on the pulpit and, and we raise our voices and, and we say, you bunch of sinners! 
And, and we scold people and we get, get on people. And, and sometimes we preachers preach as though it's rotten, it's bad. But I'm telling you folks that the gospel is not bad news, it's good news. Now we're living in a bad news world, would you agree? I mean, there's a lot of bad stuff going on in the world. People that we love are getting sick and dying of cancer. And, 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 and marriages are breaking up. And, and, and maybe sometimes the kids are rebellious. And, you know, there's a lot of bad stuff going on in the world. There, there's some wars going on in, in the Middle East. And, and, and yet, in, in this bad news world, I'm telling you, there's some good news. And you know the good news? Let me tell you the good news. God is crazy about you. He loves you. I wish that I could tell you how much God loves you. I tried to do that last night. The best that I can offer is cross. Look at the cross. That's how much God loves you. Greater life hath no man to this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. John 15 and verse 13. See, the good news is Jesus left heaven and he came to this earth so that you could go to heaven. Wow! The good news is Jesus left heaven, he came to this earth, he died upon a cross, he was buried, and he was raised. For me, for me, for you. God loves me. He's not against me. He, he, he's for me. And if God be for us, who can be against us? See, God is crazy about me. God is crazy about you. And, and, and Jesus says, I want you to go, go into all the world and preach this good news to everybody. Tell everybody that Jesus loves them. Tell everybody that Jesus died for them. Tell everybody that Jesus was buried and was raised. The heart of the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, is the fact that Jesus died and was buried and was raised. Listen to what Paul says. Moreover, brethren, brothers and sisters, I declare unto you the gospel, that's what we're talking about, which I preach to you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. Think about that. By this gospel, you're saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Paul, what did you preach? He tells us, verse 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. For I delivered unto you, first of all, I, I, I've said already this week, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. What's the main thing? No doubt about it. Paul says, I delivered unto you of first importance at the top of the list. I delivered unto you first of all that which also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And he was buried and he was raised again the third day according to the Scriptures. Paul identifies the good news, uh, the heart of the good news, the fact that Jesus died for me, he was buried for me, and he was raised for me. And Jesus says, I want you to go. Go and preach the gospel, the good news. And then he says, anybody that believes, believes what? Obviously he's talking about this gospel. You've got to believe that Jesus left heaven, he came to this earth, he died upon the cross, he was buried, he was raised. You've got to believe the good news. And that's word number one. Here's the second word that I want you to notice. The second word is this one. It's the word baptized. Jesus said anybody that believes and is baptized. What does that mean, baptized? I think there's a little confusion in our world, our religious world, about the word baptized. What does the word baptized mean? A lot of people, a lot of good people, sincere people, church-going people, look at baptism like this. Baptized? Oh, I was baptized. Uh, somebody says, you know, I don't remember a lot about it, but when I, when I was five years old, a, a, a religious leader, our, our pastor, our minister, our, our, our priest baptized me. He took a little water and, and, and sprinkled me. That was my baptism. A lot of people believe that, that baptism is a sprinkling. In fact, as I studied for this particular lesson, I found a dictionary, an English dictionary, that defined the word baptized like this. To sprinkle. I looked up in the dictionary, baptized, the very first definition, to sprinkle. To sprinkle. That's what the English dictionary says. But you know, that's not too smart, is it? It's really not too smart to let English dictionaries define Bible words. Let me illustrate what I'm talking about. There are some dictionaries that define the word believe like this, to hold an opinion. If you believe in something, you have an opinion about that, right? You hold an opinion about it. There are some dictionaries that define the word saved, and that's the word we're going to be talking about in just a few minutes, like this, to preserve. I mean, if you save something, you preserve it, right? And you ladies know, you Florida ladies know that grow gardens. If you grow a garden, you know that one of the best ways to preserve something is to can it 
or, or to pickle it, right? If you want to save it, you, you want to preserve it, you can it, or you pickle it. Now, according to some English dictionaries, you know what Jesus is saying when he said in Mark 16, 16, he that believes and is baptized should be saved? According to some English dictionaries, he's saying, he who has an opinion and is sprinkled shall be pickled. That's not, uh, that's not too smart, is it? It's really not too smart to let English dictionaries define Bible words. You say, well, Keith, what about the word baptize? What does it mean? Well, let me just share with you what the Bible says, okay? The Bible is right, amen? amen. I can be wrong, this church can be wrong, preachers can be wrong, but the Bible is right. Amen. So let me tell you what the Bible says. In John 3, verse 23, that's John 3, verse 23, the text says that John the baptizer, John the Baptist, was baptizing in Enon, your Salem. You know why he was baptizing in that particular place? For a particular reason. He was baptizing in Enon, your Salem, because, here's the reason, because there was, the Bible says, plenty, plenty of water there. Much water there. Now, folks, let's just be honest, okay? To pour water on somebody's body doesn't take a lot of water. To sprinkle somebody with water doesn't really require a lot of water. But to dip, to immerse, to cover, takes a lot of water. And, and then I think about the story of the Ethiopian. In Acts chapter 8, there's a guy from Ethiopia. We don't know his name. We call him the Ethiopian eunuch, a man who's not able to have kids. And he's taught by a fellow by the name of Philip. Philip goes to this guy and he, he begins at the very same scripture. He's reading the Bible. The guy from Ethiopia is reading the Bible. And Philip starts right there in Isaiah 53. And he talks to this guy like, uh, about Jesus, kind of like what I did last night. I, I preached about Jesus Christ. Well, as they went on their way, this guy from Ethiopia, after learning about Jesus, said to Philip, Look, here's some water. He said, Why can't I be baptized? Why shouldn't it be baptized? And you remember the story, Acts chapter 8. They stopped the chariot. They went down into the water. The preacher and the sinner... Philip and the eunuch and he, the preacher, baptized him and, Scripture says, when they were come up out of the water. And see, that's really what baptism is. It's a going down to the water. It's a coming up out of the water. And then I think about what Paul said in Romans 6 and verse 4. Therefore we are buried, not sprinkled. Therefore we are buried, not poured. Therefore we are buried with him in baptism. And ladies and gentlemen, that's really the, the, the meaning of the Greek word. Baptizo means to immerse, to cover, to bury. We, we would say in the country to dunk, to dunk. You, 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 you're dunked under water. And, and Jesus said, now anybody that believes, word one, and is baptized, word two. And here's the third word that I want you to notice. The third word is this one. It's the word saved, saved. Are you saved? Have you ever been saved? Jesus said anybody that believes and is baptized should be saved. The word saved is used in this book in at least uh, three different ways. Three different ways. Sometimes the word saved is used in the Bible in reference to physical salvation. Physical salvation. Salvation from a storm, a fire, an earthquake, a flood. Let me give you a case in point. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, that's 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20. Peter is talking about Noah. You remember the story about Noah and that boat? Peter says about Noah and the ark, wherein few, that is eight souls, were, here's the word, saved by what? By water. What does that mean? Everybody else died in that flood. Everybody else died in the, uh, in the flood, but Noah and his wife and the three sons and their wives, eight people, were in that boat, and in that ark they were saved. Water brought them up. They were saved by water. And there the word saved is used in, in Scripture in reference to physical salvation. Everybody else died in the flood, but Noah and his family were saved. They were saved physically. Well, that's not what we're talking about in Mark 16, 16. When Jesus said, anybody that believes and is baptized should be saved, he's not talking about physical salvation. And if you don't believe it, just, just think about all the Christians who have died. There have been good people who have believed the gospel and they have obeyed in baptism. They've been baptized. But we look around and where are they? Well, they're not here tonight. Why? Because they're, they're no longer living. They've died. They've gone on to the next world. So we're not talking about physical salvation. We're not saying if you do this, you know, you'll just live and live and live and never die. It's appointed unto men once to die, Hebrews 9 and verse 27. So we're not talking about physical salvation. But in the second place, sometimes the word saved 
is used in this book in reference to eternal salvation. Saved in heaven, saved now and forevermore. Saved without the possibility of being lost. Let me give you a case in point. In Revelation 21, I mentioned Revelation 21, you ought to be thinking about heaven because the entire chapter is about heaven. And in Revelation 21 and verse 24, at least in my mother's Bible, the old King James, John says, and the nations of them which are, here's the word, the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. In other words, the, these folks are in heaven. They're saved now and forevermore. They're saved and they're not going to be lost because they're in heaven. The nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. They're in heaven. They're in heaven forevermore. But that's not what Jesus is talking about in Mark 16, 16. He's not saying anybody that believes and is baptized shall be saved eternally in heaven without the possibility of being lost. And if you don't believe that, just take a look at all the Christians who are backslidden. Maybe we have a few right here among us tonight. Uh, maybe you have trusted Jesus, you believe the gospel, and maybe many, many years ago you obeyed in baptism, but if you were to die right now, maybe because you've lost your, your faith, you've lost your way, you've turned your back against God, maybe kind of like the dog that goes back to the vomit, the pig that goes back to the mud. Peter talked about that in 2 Peter chapter 2. Maybe you've been going back to that spiritual garbage. And if you were to die right now, you would not go to heaven. You would not be saved eternally. So we're not talking about eternal salvation, a locked-in, given situation. But in the third place, sometimes the word saved is used in this book in reference to salvation from past sins, forgiveness of past sins. Let me give you a case in point. Ephesians 2 verse 5. Paul said, for by grace are you saved. You say, you say Keith, I thought that was verse 8. Well, it is, again, in verse 8. He says it twice in Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2 verse 5 and in verse 8, For by grace, here's the word, are you saved? You're saved by God's goodness. You're saved by God's grace. For by grace are you saved. Saved from what? Well, in Ephesians 2 verse 1, Paul writes this, And you hath he quickened, you hath he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. They were dead in sin, they were surrounded by sin. They, they were doomed and damned before the God of heaven. They were dead in sin. But Paul says, for by grace are you saved. Saved from what? Saved from sin. In other words, they were forgiven by God's grace. And I really believe that's what Jesus is saying in Mark 16, 16. He is saying, look, do you want to be saved? Do you want to be forgiven? You want to start again? You want your past removed? Jesus says, look, anybody that believes, word one, and is baptized, word two, shall be saved, forgiven, cleansed, set free. And I tell you, folks, it feels good to be saved. I, I know sometimes in churches of Christ, we don't like to talk about feeling good. That sounds too denominational. That sounds too uh, Pentecostal. I'm telling you, it feels good to be saved. Amen. And if you're saved and going to heaven, notify your face, would you? I mean, put a smile on your face and a song in your heart and a leap in your step. You're the people of God. You're saved by grace. Going to heaven. Wow! It feels good to be saved. The Ethiopian, when he was baptized, Acts 8, he went on his way. My mother's Bible says rejoicing. I tell you, I like the translation. He went on his way feeling good. I mean, if there's anybody that ought to be optimistic, it ought to be us. You know who the optimist is? I heard about one some time ago. I heard about a guy that checked into a nursing home. He was there. He had been there for a while. And after a while, there was an old lady that checked into this nursing home, same nursing home. And uh, she straightened up her room. And After she straightened up her room, she went down to the dining area. And over in the corner, she saw this old fella sitting over there by himself. Nobody was sitting with him. So she walked over, introduced herself, struck up a conversation with this guy. And after talking to him about five minutes, this old lady said to this new friend, My, my, sir, you look like my fourth husband. <laughs> and the man said, Ma'am, fourth husband? How many husbands have you had? She said, Three. You talk about an optimist. She was an optimist, wouldn't you say? You know who the optimist is? I tell you about the optimist, folks. He's the guy that falls off of a 10-story building. 
He falls off of a 10-story building. And on the way down, at each story, at each window, he shouts in to the people inside, Hey, everything's okay so far. And you know, as God's people, we ought to be saying to the world, Hey, world, everything's okay so far. We're going to heaven. We're saved. We're forgiven. It feels good to be saved. Jesus said, Anybody that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Now, I want to give you a statement that is parallel to this statement, okay? A statement that is similar to this statement. 1st of all, I want you to consider the word comes, comes, and the word fed, fed, and the word filled, filled. Suppose I said to you, anybody that comes and is fed shall be filled. We're having a big old celebration, a dinner. Somebody's honored. And suppose I get up and I say, now anybody that comes and is fed shall be filled. If that's a true statement question, what do you have to do to be filled? Take your time. Anybody that comes and is fed shall be filled. Well, if that's a true statement, you'd have to what? You'd have to come and You'd have to be fed, right? And some of you are sitting there thinking, I, I, I'm not sure what he's talking about. And I know you're confused. I mean, it's written all across your face. So I prepared two statements for some of you, okay? I knew that some of you would need two statements. First of all, consider the word uh, cause. Cause. And the word grabbed. Grabbed. And the word rescued, rescued. Hey, Jim, tell me, tell me a, a body of water around here besides the ocean. I know you have ocean on both sides, okay? Uh, uh, water. Hollingsworth. Hollingsworth Lake? Okay, can, can, you, uh, can you drown in that lake? Okay, you're in a boat in Hollingsworth Lake, right? Hollingsworth, you can't swim. Let's say you can't swim, okay? You're in a boat and you can't swim. Suppose I said to you, anybody that calls and is grabbed should be rescued. Now, if that's a true statement, if that is true, let's just say it's true, okay? If that's a true statement, question, what do you have to do to be rescued? Hey! Yeah, you'd have to call, right? I mean, you're in a boat, the boat's going over, the boat's, you know, sinking, you'd have to what, Pete? Hey! Yeah, you'd have to call, right? Hey, I'm drowning, I can't swim. You'd have to call, and, and then somebody would have to grab you, right? You'd have to be grabbed. Anybody that calls and is grabbed should be rescued. If I got up here and I said, now, anybody that comes and is fed shall be filled, if that's a true statement, what do you have to do to be filled? Well, if that's true, you'd have to come, and, and you'd have to be fed. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, marches in here tonight. And we say, wow, Jesus, so good to see you. Thanks, thanks for coming. Uh, Lord, we're, we're so confused. One church teaches this, another church teaches that. One preacher says this, another preacher says that. Lord, we, we want to know from your very own heart, from your own words, Lord, from your own mouth, Lord, tell us, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to go to heaven? And suppose Jesus said, anybody that believes and is baptized shall be saved. It's pretty simple, isn't it? Pretty simple. Anybody that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Now, do me a favor. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to Mark 16... Verses 15 and 16 in your own Bible and see if these words are words similar to these are in your Bible. Do you see these words in your Bible in Mark 16? Let me ask you a question. What if I came and I, I taught you this? I want these folks over here to be able to see, so let me just kind of uh, do this. Suppose I came and I taught you you're saved before you believe in Jesus before you believe the gospel, and before you're baptized, suppose I came and I taught it like this. You're saved first 
Even before you believe and before you're baptized. By the way, that is not a hypothetical illustration. Do you realize that there are good people, sincere people, church-going people that teach it like this? They call it predestination. You ever heard that word? Predestination. Now, folks, the Bible teaches predestination. Just read Ephesians chapter 1. We are predestined. But there are some people that teach predestination like this. You're saved and you're lost. And ma'am, you're saved, and ma'am, you're lost. Somebody has to be lost in our illustration, I'm sorry. But you're lost, and you're saved, and you're lost. And, and if you're saved, they, they say, if you're saved, if you've been chosen, there's really nothing you can do to be lost. And if you're locked out, if you're not chosen, if you're lost, there's really nothing you, you can do to be saved. And, and some people teach predestination. Uh, you, you're, you're either chosen by God or you're not chosen. And if you're chosen, if you're saved, you're really saved before you do anything at all because God has chosen you. God has elected you. And, and really, you're saved even before you believe in Jesus. You say, but Keith, that's not in my Bible. I, I don't read that in the Bible. And you're right. You don't read that in the Bible. The Bible doesn't teach you're saved before you do anything at all. Amen. Let me ask you another question. What if I came and I taught you this? Believe in Jesus. Trust Jesus. And then you're saved. If you believe, you're saved. And then, uh, you know, you ought to be baptized. A week later, a month later, sometime later, you ought to be baptized. Some time ago, I was studying the Bible with a friend of mine, a lady by the name of Barbara. And I said, Barbara, have you ever made a commitment to Christ? She said, oh yeah. When I was 12 years old, I, I, I gave my life to Christ. I asked Him to come into my heart, and, and I was saved when I was 12. I said, Barbara, have you ever been baptized? She said, oh yeah. When I was 25, 13 years later, I was baptized. But I was saved when I was 12 years old. I asked Jesus to come into my heart, and I was baptized about 13 years later. Folks, if I got up here and I said... Believe in Jesus, and if you believe in Je if you ask Jesus to come to your heart, you'll be saved. And, and a week later, or a month later, or a year later, thirteen years later, you ought to be baptized. If I got up here and I said, "He that believes is saved," then he can be baptized. What would you say about that? You, you say, "Well, Keith, that's." Uh, let me check it out. Uh, March sixteen. Well, you know, here it is, but that's that's really not in my Bible. You know, that's the way that I was taught. But that's really not in my Bible. But, but you say, I've been baptized. As long as I've been baptized, the order's not that important. Well, if the order's not that important, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's do it like this. Let's put uh, salvation over here. And let's put belief right here. And let's put baptism right here. See, if the order's not that important, we could just change it around like this. I could teach... You're baptized before you believe. And by the way, this is not a hypothetical illustration. There are good people, sincere people, church-going people, and maybe some of you have been taught like this, right? Uh, you you, you uh, get these little infants, maybe children, two, or three, four years old, and, and you go through some kind of baptism, and if they grow up to believe in God, believe in Jesus, everything's okay. See, if it doesn't matter, we can start with baptism first. You, you say, but Keith, that's not in my Bible. Uh, Jesus did not say you're baptized before you believe, and you're right. But let me challenge you with this thought. Neither did Jesus say, believe, and then you're saved, and then you ought to be baptized. See, that's not in there either, is it? I tell you what I know to be the truth, folks. I know, that, know, to, know to be the truth what Jesus said. Jesus put it like this. Anybody, whosoever, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Now, I know that to be the truth because that's what the book says. Trust in the Lord, trust the gospel, believe the gospel. In baptism, obey what you believe. And then if you believe and you're baptized, you'll be saved. Kind of like he that calls in his grab shall be rescued. Anybody that comes in his fence shall be filled. If that's a true statement, what do you have to do to be fed? You'd have to come and be fed. If this is a true statement, he that calls in his grabs, what do you have to do to be rescued? You'd have to call and you'd have to be grabbed. 
Jesus Christ stands before you and says, anybody that believes and is baptized should be saved. Lord, tell me, what must I do to be saved? Keith, listen up. Anybody that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back to that card you filled out a few minutes ago, okay? Just open that card. And let's look at number one. Have you ever made a commitment to Christ? That was our first question. Let me tell you what most of you said. Most of you said, yes, I have made a commitment to Christ. That's wonderful. I'm glad you made that commitment. For time's sake, go down to number three. Have you been baptized? Let me tell you what most of you said. Most of you said, uh, yes, I, I have been baptized. I've been baptized. Very important question is question number five. Why? Why were you baptized? Think about it. I mean, I'm just asking, why were, you, why were you baptized? Were you baptized in order to be saved? Mark 16, 16. Were you baptized for the forgiveness of sins? Acts 2, 38. Were you baptized to have your sins washed away? Ananias said to Saul, Acts twenty two sixteen. 16. Why do you wait? Get up, be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Were you baptized to put on Christ? You know, before I came to church tonight, I put on this coat. In Galatians 3, 26 and 27, Paul said, You're all the children of God by faith. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, into Christ, have put on Christ. So were you baptized to put on Christ? Were you baptized to get into Jesus? Romans 6 and verse 3, No, you're not. There's so many of us as we're baptized into Jesus Christ. We're baptized into His death or His blood. So were you baptized to get into Christ and into the blood of Christ? You say, Keith, I've been baptized. I'm glad you've been baptized. Why did you do it? Why did you do it? Let me tell you what maybe a few of you said, maybe four or five of you said, I I've never been baptized. Tonight's the night. Tonight's the night. See, I would say to you, why do you wait? What are you waiting for? I heard about a guy that was not a Christian. He had never obeyed Jesus. But every time the door was open, he attended a little country church with his wife. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, he was always there. His wife was a Christian, but he wasn't. And yet every time the door was open, he was there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And when this little country church had a revival like we're having this week, he was, all, he was always there, Monday night, Tuesday night. And, and when this little country church that they attended had a revival, the local preacher like Bob and the visiting guy like myself would go out to see this guy to urge him to be saved. They would just encourage him to obey Jesus. And, and, and he was always so nice about it. He would say to these two preachers who would come, Fellas, I, I'm glad you're here. And, and I know why you're here. I, I've been going to that church for many years with my wife and, She's a member down there, and I've never become a member. And I know that you want me to be saved. And I've been thinking about it. And one day I'm going to do it. Hey, hey, fellas, don't worry about me. Thank you for coming, but usually he would put his arms around these two preachers, and he would thank them, and he would say, fellas, everything's okay. Don't worry about me. And that went on for years. I'm talking about years. And one day this guy that I'm talking about was out in the field working. A tractor turned over on him, pinned him underneath. A neighbor friend saw it. Came running, couldn't do anything. Other neighbors and friends were called. And finally that tractor, that farm machine was removed. And the guy was a, man, he was a horrible mess. It had crushed his chest. Blood was coming out from his nose and out from his mouth. Well, they put him on the stretcher into the ambulance. And the ambulance driver started speeding toward town to the hospital. And they passed that little country church house where he had attended with his wife most of his life. And this hurt guy, the guy in the ambulance, began to cry. Please stop. As they passed that little country church building, he was saying to the driver, Driver, sir, don't take me to the hospital. Stop. Stop right here. Stop at the church building. I want to I obey Jesus. I want to be baptized. As you can imagine, the ambulance driver was more interested in his body than his soul. Kept going toward town. And there he died, just begging, just pleading for another opportunity to obey Jesus. Folks, we don't want you to die having to beg for another opportunity to obey Jesus. We have some... Young folks in this audience that need to do what's right. You say, Keith, I don't know what to say when I come forward. Just bring your card. Just come and bring your card and give it to, give it to me. Give it to Bob. Uh, you, you say, well, I don't know what to say. You don't have to say anything at all except, hey, I want to become a Christian. Would you like to become a Christian? 
We have some people who need to become Christians. You say again, preacher, you're not talking to me because I've been baptized. Oh, you've been baptized? You say, yeah, I was baptized to be saved. I was baptized into Christ. How are you and Jesus doing, honestly? Do you love Jesus more right now than you've ever loved Him in your life? You pray more now than you've ever prayed. You give more now than you've ever given. You read and study His Word more right now than you've ever read and studied His Word. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. See, I think we have some Christians here tonight who really need to get serious about Jesus. So why not tonight? Why not tonight? Will you be saved? Why not tonight? Who's going to lead the way? Christian, do you need to come for prayer, restoration, encouragement? Non-Christian, do you need to come and just obey Jesus in baptism? Why don't you come right now? Don't, don't stand and sing as if to say, hey, I'm okay, everybody's okay, you're okay, I'm okay. Hey, why don't you just, don't even pick up a song book. Just come and say, I'm ready. I put it off long enough. Why not tonight? Who's going to lead the way? We will see, heaven will see, as we sing this invitation song.